Okay, so I have the machine mostly back together now, but haven't really done much with it for a while. Uh, I got sidetracked with updating my website and moving to different server hosting, and also updating the Rube program, and that took way longer than I thought, so um, I actually haven't really done much with this <laughs> since my last video. But you can see, it's all all back together, nice, nice shiny aluminium table there bed, table bed there now. Um, so what I have done that's a little bit different is I tidied up these drag chains, or I actually made use of the drag chains. So we have the motor cables coming in here, and they're stuck at each end like that. So they're only supposed to be moving inside the chain, and then when they get to here, they're fixed on the sides there again. So I just went crazy with zip ties all over the place to stick everything together. And I just have the X and Y motors coming, sorry, the Y and the Z motors coming through here. This little bit of plywood is going to be replaced with aluminium soon. And just a bit of aluminium angle on the bottom there with some rivets. Um, and then the spindle cable at the moment is not part of that. And the main reason is that when I bought this cable I got a piece that was a little bit too short, which is really stupid of me. I thought I'd measured it just from the CAD program, I thought the measurements, rough measurements would be enough, but it was a little bit too short, so I'm going to have to do it this way. And I just want to see if that's going to have any effect. If you put this right next to the limit switches, I was just sort of wondering if it might cause problems with false uh, positives for the limit switch hitting. Anyway, coming over here, we've got a drag chain on this one again, and another piece of temporary plywood. All stuck with zip ties there. Seems to be quite nice. This is a bit flexy, of course, but it won't be once I put the aluminium one on. And at the top end of the spindle cable, it just comes out the top here like this. And I did actually buy a nice, cute little drag chain, like a 10 by 10 millimeter one that I could have used here to make it go over there like that. But it turns out that this cable's fairly stiff, so I'm just going to leave it like that. It seems like it'll keep itself out of the way well enough. So regarding the limit switches, the reason I haven't put those on yet is because I rather stupidly bought the wrong type. I thought I was buying normally closed, but when I, mean, I checked on the listing that I got them from, and also you can see right there it says NO. <laughs> um, and I could use these, of course, normally open would still do the job, but they don't cost that much, so I thought it would be better to just get the ones that are normally closed, and um, that would be a little bit safer. And the other reason I hadn't put them on is because, again, I stupidly bought a little bit too short length of the cable there. This is a three-wire shielded cable that I was going to use for the limit switches. Um, but that cable has arrived now, and I've got heaps of it. should have way more than enough. And also here i got uh, another length of the spindle cable, which will be long enough to, if I want to, make, it go, make the spindle cable go all the way through the drag chain as well. Uh, I'm probably going to be a little bit too lazy to do that, but at least I have the cable to do it. Um, the problem is that there's quite a lot of work soldering on the tabs at the end, and then you've got to thread it through the cable as well. So uh, it's probably not necessary even, at least for now, because this cable, as it is, there's plenty of room here to just sort of dangle around. But later on I might want to put some shelves down here, in which case this, this cable uh, would be much better to come from over here with everything else and into the drag chain would be much tidier. On the electronics side of things, uh, I added the plugs for the limit switches there, so that's going to be X, Y, Z, and those are just 12mm um, plugs versus the, I think they're 20 or 18, those ones at the top for the stepper motors. And they're connected all up inside, ready to go here. Uh, it's a little bit dodgy, I've got some of that stuff there exposed. That's just a sort of a common rail so that I could get the 24 volts to all of them from the uh, power supply. So this 24 volt power supply is coming over there and then it splits into three. And then the signal wires themselves, why is it so dark? The signal wires themselves are going into that shielded one there, that's the blue and the brown and the yellow. And they're going through the shielded cable down to there. So they're shielded all the way to there. Um, I thought it would be a good idea to shield these ones as much as possible versus these 60 volt signals that are going through here probably didn't need quite so much shielding. I was just looking at these rails the other day and I noticed that they're 
got quite a bit of rust on them already. Uh, it's not on the part where the balls were sliding. Fortunately I did run these up and down to get grease or a little bit of grease on the part where the balls contact so that doesn't seem to have rusted but yeah that's a little bit uh, disappointing. I wasn't expecting it to rust that quickly and I mean, it hasn't even been that humid here. We've had a fairly dry summer like it rained a little bit one time but uh, yeah so I have to I guess scotch bright rub that off and then um, put some sort of oil or maybe even WD-40 temporarily will be good enough until I can get something better or grease maybe I just rub the grease on there would that work what do you think but anyway yeah that's something I'll have to keep an eye on I suppose these caster wheels here I'm really glad that I changed these to the bigger more sturdy ones because now that the full weight of the aluminium uh, table and everything is on there. Uh, even these ones are starting to get a little bit stiff. Uh, again, when they're rolling in a straight line already, that's pretty much fine. It's just when they need to turn around that they get a little bit sticky. Um, and again, if the floor that I was rolling them on was a little bit nicer, it wasn't like this crap with hole, uh, holes and like dents in it, <laughs> that would be nice. Um, but they're doing way better than the other ones would have been. And I'm starting to think that maybe I should have welded fully along the edge there instead of just that little tack because I'm starting to see that um, well it's alright now but sometimes I've, I'm seeing that the whole uh, leg or the arm of this piece here is sort of starting to bend sideways when I'm trying to turn it around so um, yeah they're just borderline even though I made them better and another thing I got on a recent shopping trip was this shop vac um, it's fairly cheap actually, only 99 New Zealand dollars, so it's like 60 something US dollars. Um, it says 18 litre there, which is a lot bigger than my other one, so it should be a bit more uh, suitable. And I'll be able to keep this one outside. That other one that I was using before is the one that I used to clean the carpet inside the house, and I just wanted to keep that a little bit cleaner than it was getting. It was starting to get a bit all cobwebby and mucky. Um, yes, yeah, so I don't know how well this one's going to work. We'll have to try this later. There was also an 18 litre. I mean a 30 litre one rather than 18 but as far as I could tell just looking at the picture the bit on the top is the same and it was just the bucket that was bigger so I didn't really feel like paying it twice as much as they wanted for that one and I just thought that <laughs> didn't seem like a good value proposition but this one we yeah, have pretty cheap so my next job is mounting the waste board and this is something I hadn't really thought a whole lot about um, so I'm going to use these 600 by 1200 by 18 millimeter MDF boards which will fit on here just perfectly and um, yeah I hadn't actually thought about this but they fit on here so perfectly that there's going to be 15 millimeters at each end and about 5 millimeters on the sides clearance so it's like almost as if I had designed it to be that way but it was actually just by chance. As for how to mount that MDF onto here I'm just going to do it the same way as I did with the small CNC that is to drill and tap a hole in here and then use these countersunk M5 bolts to just hold it down um, and with the 18 millimeter MDF even if I put this all the way through there that sticks up about eight millimeters at the top so we should have about 10 millimeters clear of the top of the bolt before the cutter is going to run into this um, now that's all very well the first time you put the MDF on because you can just clamp the MDF down or drill some holes first and then clamp it down and then transfer punch the holes locations onto here and everything will be in the right place for the first waste board you have but when it comes time to drill the holes in the second waste board to get them in the right place I think I'm going to have to do something like this um, so you can get these little things which fit into a hole on the left hand side you put that into your in this case I think 10 millimeter hole and then it's got this little spike on the top and you would like press the piece of wood that you want to align onto there and it would make a, a little dent in the in the wood so that you know where the hole should be so I think what I'm gonna to have to do is come up with something like this in M5 size which I could probably just cut somehow on the machine once I've got it all ready and put those in the hole so that there's a little spike there put my next waste board on and then just you know press it down on top of all those spikes to get the marks. I'm using this fancy thing to drill these holes and also the countersink holes. It's uh, just a little bit easier than doing it with a hand drill and it makes sure that they're straighter um, and I can also make sure that my countersink part doesn't go too 
far because I can get it exactly just to there, which is what I'm looking for. Um, the other thing I noticed about this is that when you're drilling uh, like a large drill like this, it tends to grab because the MDF is quite soft and it suddenly like shoves itself down further, which is what I do not want to happen. So doing it with a drill press like this gives me a lot more strength to stop that from happening. So I can just get it to there and stop. Okay, so that gives us what looks like about nine millimeters of clearance at the top here, which is half of the 18 millimeters that we can go down before we have to worry about hitting these screws. And it gives us about 10 millimeters of uh, contact with the aluminium at the bottom, so I think that should be okay. <clears throat> so I will of course be using this drill press thingy for the holes in the aluminium as well, at least the ones I can reach with it. Unfortunately these ones along the side here um, can't get to it with them, so I'm just going to have to do that with the hand drill. Okay, I have that wasteboard stuck on there now. I decided to make it come all the way to this end, uh, for reasons which I, I don't think I'll bother going into, but uh, it's stuck down there nicely and we've got about that much space. And I'm just running, oh, I was just running a test here with the spindle going while the motors are moving just to see if there was any problems caused for the steppers. I guess I can't really tell <laughs> if I'm not cutting anything because to check if something's gone wrong I'd need to actually have a result to look at to see if the steppers were missing steps or something uh, due to, uh, you know, I'm just thinking that maybe the spindle cable here going alongside the stepper motor cables in here might be potentially causing a problem, but I don't think so. So I'm just going to assume that that's okay, seems to be alright. Uh, next job is to use this, and this is a, I think it's a one inch uh, Forstner style bit that's going to, or planing bit, whatever you call it, and I'm just going to do small areas at first and check. Uh, I don't know how much I'm going to worry about this, but the idea is that you would check that you don't have like it going like that, the surface go like that, and then up and down, up and down like that, um, which would mean that the bit, instead of cutting vertically, is cutting at an angle like that as it cuts. And then the idea is that you would try and get rid of that by twiddling around with the mount of these bolts here to fix it a little bit. Um, and that's going to run on a quarter inch collet, which I actually had already, which is nice. Um, over here we have the vacuum cleaner, which I tried. Oh, where is it? There. Um, it's quite loud and powerful. And the blower function, which I actually wasn't really too concerned with. See that there? Blower function. I was like, yeah, who cares? I don't really need that. I found <laughs> I can use, use that to sweep my garage floor. Because this garage doesn't have a door on it, so it just gets dust and leaves and everything blow in there all the time. Like every few days, there's just like a pile of dust and leaves in there, if it's been windy. Um, but with the blower, I can just blow it straight back out instead of having to sweep it manually. It's quite nice. Um, yeah, so it's going to be too loud and too powerful for like MDF, and if I'm going to be machining foam maybe soon. Um, uh, <laughs> I'd like to really turn the power and the noise down somehow, if I could, like my other vacuum cleaner does, which is a really nice feature. The other thing is that this... Um, size is actually pretty small. Um, it'll be good for collecting aluminium and it's just a empty bucket sort of thing in there. Oh well, it was a filter. Whoops. Yeah, but it's just a big empty plastic bucket. But what's interesting about this is the sides are kind of sloped down a bit like that, just, just slightly. I mean sloped in at the bottom. So what that means is if I could get a larger bucket that fits up to about here on it, I could just cut this whole bottom piece off and then jam it down into the larger bucket and this bucket would immediately become like twice or even three times as large. So that's something that I might look into in the future. So here's how that looks inside. Uh, it's just a plastic bucket with a, sort of a nozzle, can't turn this, but um, just sort of directs the flow down to one side. Um, so for, if I'm going to be machining XPS foam, which probably will be at least a little bit, maybe a lot, um, that's going to just swirl around in here like crazy, and I'm going to have all those problems that Daniel RC Test Flight was having, uh, so not really looking forward to that. These bits down here are a bit strange, they're the um, holes for the wheels to stick in, but there's a big gap here, I can stick my finger in between the wall there, which is kind of weird, because like all kinds of stuff's going to get stuck in there, isn't it? 
I think if I was designing this I would have tried to make those wheels go right up against the edge. I don't see why they couldn't have done that. Yeah, but anyway, this is uh, it's going to be a little bit small, I think, still. And regarding the rust on these rails here, I found that it actually wasn't as bad as it looked at first. I was able to wipe off about half of it just with a tissue, because it was really just kind of a fuzziness on top. And there's still some underneath there, of course. Uh, I was also pleasantly surprised to see that it, it's not rusting on the bottom edges here, because that would have been a pain in the butt to clean and, and keep an eye on. Uh, it really only seems to be where the surface is vertical to gravity, so I'm not sure if moisture sort of <laughs> settles from gravity. I guess it would a little bit. Uh, and these ones here, of course, because these are vertical to gravity, they ha have hardly rusted at all. Uh, it's just a little bit over on the inside of that one there. And these here, just by chance, these happen to have a light smearing of grease on top. So this would have been, if my theory about being faced on to gravity is correct, this would have been as rusty as, as these other bits here, but it's not. And so it looks like just having a little bit of grease on there is going to be good enough to protect it. Uh, so what I'm going to do is just take this old brush that's basically past its use by date, and I'm just going to spray this into the bristles of the brush and give a light brush of the, that grease along here and just call it good for now. There we go. I think that should be better than nothing at least. Uh, I should probably, you know, rub it with the scotch brite or something a little bit properly sometime, but <laughs> I'll just leave it like that for now. And I also put these little green things in here because I hadn't done that and it occurred to me that there's about to be a lot of dust. So I should probably try and stop it from going in there. That's not going to work, is it? <laughs> I was going to sit here and type some G-code just manually to like, you know, one move at a time, make it go down and then across a little bit and then over and... Uh, doesn't look like that's going to work because <laughs> it's going gonna, it's gonna to start a fire or something. Alright, well that looks pretty good so far, but I'm going to have to go back to FreeCAD and generate a proper program for this rather than just typing it in. I just typed that one in, uh, but that's going to be too slow. Well, I tried to do that with FreeCAD, but for some reason the program kept freezing up for like 30 seconds at a time, and it was basically unusable. So I thought, why don't I take this opportunity to try using Kitty Moto, which is a CAM plugin for Onshape, uh, a browser-based CAD program that I've been trying recently, and I really like it. And I think I, I got this up and running in Kirimoto about as quickly as I could have done it in FreeCAD, even though I've only used Kirimoto for about 10 minutes prior to this, and I've used FreeCAD for like 5 or 6 months, well, off and on, you know. Anyway, uh, so we got this. It's not quite what I wanted. I wanted it to be just going up and down like that. It's just a little bit easy when I'm trying to hold the vacuum near it. Um, and I also noticed, fortunately, because this is such a simple program, I was able to look at the G-code and, and, you know, grok what was happening with it all. And some of the feed rates were wrong. It was giving very fast feed, feed rates through what would have been material, which it shouldn't have been doing, and plunging quicker than it should have as well. So I had to uh, fix it by hand a fair bit, which is a little bit uh, not quite what I was hoping for. Uh, see what I mean? Actually, I should have I should have realised this myself just looking at that on screen that this was going to happen, but it's not um, cutting. See, I'm using a roughing operation because uh, I actually can't remember why, but there's something about the surfacing or the clearing operation in Kirimoto that wasn't going to do what I wanted. But it looks like this isn't quite doing it either because we've got like this curve bit here has been left behind. Um, but the main reason I stopped the program there was the dust. At first I thought, oh this is great, there's not much dust coming off at all, but then I realized I just couldn't see it. It's so fine, it's all the way over here, and all the way over the back of there. And in these, when the background is dark here like that, you could just see it in a very fine mist. Well, I had that vacuum cleaner going the whole time, mostly right next to the cutting head, making a hell of a noise, and it seems to have done absolutely nothing. So, 
of course making a dust boot with the, like the brushes and stuff to stick on here was one of my early it wasn't really my first priority but I think it might be becoming my first priority after this now see oh my god look at all that you wouldn't think that just a half a millimeter of 30 centimeter square MDF would create this much dust okay so I wrote a couple of manual programs manual programs yeah manually coded programs to just cut off these little bits here just a diagonal cross like that uh, and then I also put a little bit extra cut in here so that the square could fit all the way to there and I'm checking the squareness and it is extremely good not quite perfect I think to get it perfect I'd have to move this to the right about half a millimeter just at a sort of a estimate and it's not actually that hard to do that um, so what I would do is these black marks to show me where the grub screws are get the grub screws in the right place like that and then loosen those and then turn the screw uh, one revolution of this is 10 millimeters movement so to get a half a millimeter I'd have to turn it a 20th of a revolution so it's really really just a finicky fine little adjustment and I don't think I'm going to bother with that for now I'll just go with it as it is um, maybe if I need it to for something really precise in future I'll come back and do that but as a starting point it's quite good and also these ridges here seem to be good enough that I'm just going to leave it as is as well uh, you can see them yeah and you can definitely feel them but it feels like maybe maybe a tenth of a millimeter there and what's interesting is that a lot of them when you try rubbing your fingernail along it's actually catching coming from both ways so I think what we might be seeing here is just the fact that the step over was like a hundred percent so this is a one inch that's so 24 25.4 millimeters and I just did the whole hundred percent width uh, so there could be just a little bit right on the edge that didn't quite get cut and that's actually what it feels like to be honest so in future I don't think I'll do a hundred percent step over I'll maybe just go to like 98 95 or something like that so that we won't get so there'll be no ambiguity about what I'm feeling here whether it's just a little bit that didn't get cut or whether it's like one side of the cut is lower than the other because really I can't tell actually it occurred to me that if these ridges that my fingernail were catching on were just ridges not that would not cut rather than like the slope from being mistrammed a little bit of sanding would like tell us the answer so 120 grit for about 15 seconds on here and sure enough like it's really really good like I can't even feel that there's like a sawtooth pattern that you'd get if the spindle wasn't trammed right and all those little ridges that my fingernails were catching on are gone I am super happy with that because like I've done zero adjustment other than you know trying my best to make sure that this whole structure was nice and straight of course and I think that was worth it because that is a great result <laughs> oh, yes Okay, so I drew a black line around the area that I just surfaced there. So it should give you a little bit better picture of where it is. And there's that bit there that we can't get to. And there's also a bit at the front that we can't get to. Uh, I could have actually surfaced slightly larger than this. Uh, but the black line is where the center of the cutter is able to reach. So you can see that the cutter is actually going along that black line. So I, the surfacing could have actually been a half inch. Well, uh, wider each way uh, but this this black line is, is where the tool can actually the center of the tool can get to um, and I did this by writing a program to custom calculate a surfacing um, path because I figured it's fairly easy it's just like you know going backwards and forwards like this especially if you know that you're only going to be doing a rectangle and there's certain other things I wanted it to do like when it was finished I wanted it to go back out of out of the way over there and uh, I wanted to try and do it efficiently so anyway I wrote a little JavaScript program to do that that's what we're looking at here or well, that's the result of it there and my program is here so you put in a uh, X size Y size blah 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 step over all that stuff there 
Oh yeah, and I wanted to have a spindle warm-up time. So anyway, I'll put this up on my website somewhere, I guess. Um, I'll have to mention a few caveats uh, <laughs> when I do that, though. Like, there's no really no error checking, and it's only ever going to give you a pattern that goes vertically in the zigzags, never horizontally, because I'm just basically making it for my machine. And when I do this, I don't really want the heavy part of the machine, the gantry, to be going backwards and forwards like that. Uh, I want the lighter section of it to be going back and forwards, doing the most of the movement. And the moon is just poking over the horizon. Now it's kind of annoying that this garage doesn't have a front door, but on the other hand I notice things like this <laughs> going on in the world around me a little bit more than I would if I was within four walls. It's very, very orange in person, but for some reason the camera is not showing that. Here's, <laughs> here's what that looks like in the daylight so we can see it better. Uh, so next thing I'm, I'm going to try is a little bit of 3D contour milling, which I've always wanted to try, but my little CNC didn't really have the vertical travel to do that. So this is what I'm going to attempt here. It's a 16 by 8 prop. I just found this on a like a 3D CAD file sharing website, and it looks like it's pretty nicely made. And I was able to import that into Onshape and scoop out a little bit from the hub on the top because it was quite thick. It was like 18, 19 millimeters thick and I just made it to 15 millimeters thick in the middle uh, just in case I ever do end up using this on an actual plane this uh, this one I won't be because I'm just making it out of this piece of pine clear here which is begging for it because the dimensions see it's 40 by 18 and the dimensions of this stock is 38 and then 18.4 um, is basically the thickness that it needs to be, but when I measure this it's 18.3 in, in reality. So it just seems like the perfect thing and they're quite nice and cheap so I'll probably be chopping up quite a few of these in my tests for you know tool pathing of um, contours and stuff like that. Okay so I haven't checked the feeds or speeds in this material. I'm assuming it's going to be quite similar to MDF, probably a little bit softer actually. Um, so I'm just going to use similar to what I was doing before, and this is a 4mm end mill. I would be using a 6 for this, but it hasn't arrived yet. Anyway, let's see what happens. I wonder why it goes zip zip through there. Yeah, this, see that? Do you see that? that that's the problem with um, Kirimoto. It doesn't, it doesn't calculate the feet right when it's... It thinks it's moving through nothing, but it's not. It's moving through material. That's a bit of a problem, eh? So that was a bit rough, um, it was going quite fast and um, the flutes on that, that cutter are not very deep so I think they weren't really suitable um, and also the material's not stuck down in the middle so it's kind of buzzing a little bit when it got to here um, but it did okay other than that the wood was kind of splitting the big chunks of it popping out as it moved along uh, which is not very good and we can see that at least the simulation from, from Kirimoto is correct because it predicted this and it predicted these little mountains here as well um, so it just seems like that Kirimoto software is it seems like it might be more focused on 3D printing it's, at least that's how it was started as a project maybe and a lot of the uh, calculations that you can get away with for 3D printing maybe they don't quite carry over to CAM when your print head is actually four millimeters wide instead of like what is it on a 3D printer? It's like tenth of a millimeter or quarter of a millimeter or something. Um, so yeah, it's just not cutting all the way through in some places. And many many times it blasted through the material at rapid speed where there was still material remaining that it just didn't seem to be aware of. Um, so I'm not sure if I'd be. Uh, and yeah, I'll, I'll keep using it. 
and I'm sure it'll get better, but you just gotta keep an eye on it, I think. Rapiding through when it moves. Oh, See that speed, speed? And then this one's probably going to be rapid speed. Yeah. Okay, so I stopped that job there. In case you couldn't hear what I was saying before, the um, rapids, rapid speed was being used to move sideways to the next row. Even though there's a huge amount of material there that it's moving into, it was moving basically as fast as the machine can go <laughs> into the next uh, this part of the wall here. So that's part of a problem, part of the problem, and I could avoid that by turning the rapid speed down to about three percent, and that seemed to be uh, okay. But the next problem was that um, as we got deeper in here, the height of this wall, being you know close to 16, 18 millimeters or something like that, it's actually higher than the length of cutting edge that we have on this flute here which is I think about 12, maybe 12 or 14 or something like that so what it was doing is it's just pushing this top part here which has no blade at all into the top edge of the wood there and you can see it's all splitting and fraying and everything um, yeah so that's not good so I had stopped it there but to be honest um, kind of found out what I wanted to know already I'm not sure if I'll oh yeah I'll probably I guess I could chop this off with a sharp knife, this edge here is quite thin and that's that's the main part that was causing problems and, and also this bit here would have to be chopped as well, see it's quite thin I can almost just break it off actually um, yeah so I'll, I think I'll let it run out, run the rest of the job just to see what it looks like overall uh, and you can maybe see the ridges on there, it doesn't look that smooth but when you touch it, actually not too bad so this is a 6mm ball end mill and 20% step over. So uh, what's that, 1.2mm per stripe or per pass, row, whatever. Okay, I just ran a profile cut around the outside, or I think it's a outline, as Kirimoto calls it. So it just looks like that, just vertical walls around the outside. But um, Kirimoto also has a widen feature. So even though I was using a 4mm end flute, or end mill, to do that, I've widened it by 50% so that this 6mm ball mill will be able to fit in that gap there, all the way along here like this. And it's gone down to six millimeters there, not all the way down. Otherwise, it would have um, broken through at the at the tips here. I wanted to leave it stuck on there still, all the way at the at the bottom face. Um, and yeah, that should prevent this from having to like slam into the wall sideways. And so I'm going to run this again. And I changed this program for the contour milling like that. And I just replaced all of the rapids with uh, feed rate movements. <laughs> so it's going to be a little bit slow here because when it gets to here normally it would come up here and it would just wrap it across to the other side to do that and wrap it back across on this flat area but it's not going to do that it's just going to move slowly across so this this whole section here will be unnecessarily slow but that was the easiest way that I could manually change the g-code file. Now I sped it up considerably now that I know well I know that it's not going to be hitting the walls but also noticed that it was going much slower than it should have been for some reason it was taking the vertical plunge feed rate for every movement when a lot of this movement's not really that vertical, you know, it's going mostly horizontal so I sped it up to take that into account um, it's not actually supposed to be cutting anything right at the moment it's just going over the, over the piece that it's already done so it will be cutting something in a minute Thank <laughs> you. 
Turned out alright, I think. Um, <laughs> only problem is that the toolpath that I used for roughing was created before I changed the design of the propeller to have that scalloped out bit, and the contour one that we just did skips any flat surfaces like that, so it skipped that bit in the middle, so I'll just have to do the roughing again to chop that little plateau off there, I think. That's all we needed to do from that pass. Okay, overall I think that turned out fairly nice. I just did a little bit of sanding on it. Um, took a little bit more sanding than I thought to get rid of these ridges, but still wasn't too long. But I think if I was doing this in future for a, a prop that I actually wanted to use on a plane, I would decrease this step over by maybe even down to half of what it is, so like just under one millimeter, and then increase the feed speed so the, the time to do it would be about the same, but you get a easier to use result I think. Um, so what I'm going to do now is, I wasn't really planning on doing this at all, but since it's turned out reasonably well to this point, I'm going to flip it over and try and machine the back, but there are a number of reasons why this is probably not going to work very well at all. The main reason is that when I made these <coughs> holes, I just sort of quickly drilled some holes by eye at what looked like about the midpoint of the uh, width of wood there. So they're not precisely located in any way whatsoever, although they are fairly well centered. The other problem is that I didn't use any locating pins here, I'm just using these wood screws to get them in there, and these are not going to be exactly in the right place anyway. Um, another problem is that when I did this contour, or the uh, outline as it's called in Kirimoto, profile cut here, I've cut further than halfway through, so if you look at the tip of the prop there, uh, that is, you know, the bit at the bottom has to be cut through to finish and that means it's going to, like, there's nothing holding it anymore. So we could be looking at quite a disaster coming up, but I'll, <laughs> I'll give it a try and uh, see what happens. Okay, I set up all the tool paths for the reverse side and I managed to put a tab just almost at the end here. I didn't really want to put it right at the end because that would be very thin and I've also cut through it, but I think I can uh, keep it here, it should be alright. And I also realised that the fact that this um, this is now the reverse side of the prop, like the rear side of the prop as you're looking in the flying the plane. Um, this being flat here is actually a blessing in disguise because it means that we don't have to cut anything here. It's already, this is the final surface right there where I've put the pen approximately. Uh, and the gap underneath, the three millimeters there, we can just fill that with an appropriately sized little bit of spacer. And then I can clamp that down and we don't have to worry about the fact that there's a screw head here because we're not even going to get near it. Okay, that's with the rough cut done. It looks, looks kind of neat there, doesn't it, with the contour lines. And we're just hanging on by our chinny chin chin with a little bit of tab there. But I'm kind of optimistic it'll go okay, and it's nice to have three points of fixture now at least. Thank you. 
Whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, look at that. That's the X motor driver. And it detected that it was missing steps. So it stopped. And ideally, that would inform the controller that that happened and it would just sort of stop or error or pause or whatever, do something. Um, fortunately, it didn't ruin my work, but I have lost the X position. And I've been noticing that that happens a little bit now after changing the gantry to be aluminium because it's much, much heavier than it was before. And once in a while, it just seems to have trouble moving it in this direction as, at least as quickly as I'm trying to get it to do. So I think all I can do is just slow it down a bit maybe. Okay, that's with the profile cut or the outline cut out. And it's really starting to look like a propeller now. Um, and you can see from this little bit of misalignment here in the, in the side wall there, that's how misaligned this has been by me not using proper aligning pegs. Um, looks like about a millimeter and a half difference there and that actually might be kind of convenient because when I was looking at the CAD design for this prop it looked quite thick and chunky through here compared to some of the ones that I have like the the bought ones that I bought for Big Red and I was wondering how I could um, edit this design to make it a little bit thinner but this might be one way to do it not a very good way but um, I'm going to go ahead with it, and uh, I forgot to mention that when I put this on here, when I flipped it over, the hole in the middle was about a quarter of a millimeter off what it should have been. So this might actually be a reasonably usable prop. This bit here I shouldn't have rounded over. I put a fillet on these corners that it's doing there. This edge is just there and then that one. But I could have just done that with sandpaper afterwards and saved this time here. Doesn't really need to do any of this. Okay, so that went about as well as I could have expected it to. I thought for sure something was going to go wrong, but it didn't really. Uh, I stopped the job after the first attempt because I realized it was going a quarter of the speed that it was supposed to be, so I fixed that and then we got through it uh, pretty quickly, probably 22 minutes or so, something like that. And I'm quite surprised at how well this plain old pine machines uh, it's holding together okay at the tips there just with that little bit of um, tab there. I'll have to break that off. And yeah, it's it's giving a decently good finish. There's a little bit of fuzziness in parts like just there. You can see right on the edge. But on the main surface where it's, uh, you know, like here, yeah, it feels quite nice. Turns out those tabs on the end were only barely holding on by about a millimeter and a half, maybe two millimeters. So I'll have to be careful with that in the future and try and do it a bit more properly than I did today. Okay, so I sanded that up and it turned out really nice. Took quite a lot longer to sand it than I thought though, so I'll definitely be decreasing the step over on that, um, that final contouring pass. And it's just a little nick there. Oh god, my hand's shaking. <laughs> By the way, people who wonder about why my hand shakes like that sometimes, uh, it always it seems to do it more when I'm trying to hold things still too, it's really annoying. Uh, and I think it's just um, due to a motorbike crash that I had when I was living in Japan a long time ago, about I don't know, 10, 10 years ago now, maybe 12 years ago. But I broke my finger and the fingernail there got completely ripped out and um, my hand very nearly 
like broke bones inside the hand as well, it got completely crushed and it swelled up to three times its size, up to the elbow and yeah, it was, I was quite lucky not to damage that hand a lot more but I think that's why it shakes like that so don't worry it's not not Parkinson's or anything like that, I hope and anyway, so I'll just let it shake now that you know why it's doing it let's look at the back and uh, looks pretty good it's um, a little bit thinner than it should be I think so if we look at the trailing edge here it's almost paper thin which I don't mind let me just put this here so you can see it without shaking yeah I don't mind that really um, I wouldn't want it to be any more thinner than that because then it would be reducing the the cord of the blade as well but as it is that's probably just fine and I weighed it and it's 29 grams which is a few grams lighter than the, the other ones I have but they have a clear coat or a varnish or something on them so I think by the time I clear coat this which I will try um, it'll probably be about the same weight as those but overall I'm quite happy with it um, and it seems to be perfectly the same as the CAD design model even the tip here has uh, in the model it has a little bit of a squareness on the tip of it there like a little flat edge right on the tip and and that has actually happened <laughs> in, re in reality which is good I think anyway so um, yeah I'm going to put this on a motor now spin it up and uh, see how much thrust we can get from it on 4S Okay, I set up a little test stand here. I balanced the prop, but um, I, I balanced the blades, like I didn't balance the hub quite as well as I should have. I'd spent about 15 minutes on it, it seemed to be okay, but now that I'm spinning it here... Oh, that's funny. It seems fine now. It was... Oh, there we go. When you get to that speed, it starts to shudder a bit, but I think when we go over that speed, it will maybe smoothen out a bit. I uh, haven't tried that yet, just in case it explodes, I'd like to get it on camera. Two things, I wanted to check the current at one kilogram thrust. This is with the 4S battery, it's just on 16 volts at the moment, so slightly more than storage charge. Um, yeah, so current at one kilo thrust, and then what do we get thrust-wise at full throttle? Alright, so let's go for one kilo thrust. That's about 11 amps. I think that's a, a bit more than I remember from my other props, like the bought ones. I should probably stick... Oh, this is 16.8 though, isn't it? I was trying 16.10, which is a bit different. But I do have a 16.8 bought one that I'll try afterwards to compare this. Anyway, so 11 amps for one kilo, and then let's just run it up to full throttle and see what happens. Oh, I think the ESC had a bit of a problem with that. I didn't quite get to full throttle. Oh, that's quite warm. What? What was the current there? I wasn't watching the current, but maybe we we overcurrented this ESC a little bit. I've let the ESC cool a little bit, and I'll, I want to do one run to full throttle properly, but I'll have to do it quicker this time so it doesn't spend so much time at a high throttle setting. Here we go. Oh, no, it must be still too warm. It goes up to 5 amps, no problem. So that's okay. Oh, we got to 10 that time. Yeah, oh well. It looks like that's the end of this video. We, we kind of got a bit sidetracked anyway, didn't we? Because this was supposed to be about the uh, CNC machine. Hold on, I figured it out. And if there was anybody out there yelling at their screen, check the prop nut! You would have been right because um, that squealing noise, I really should have recognized that sooner, shouldn't I? It's just the prop nut. I think it's just because it's um, vibrating slightly. Um, the prop nut came a little bit loose, so 
Should be okay now. Let me get behind my screen again. Core intact. All right, about two and a half kilos at uh, full throttle. I, could, I wasn't watching the current again there. Oh, I guess that's the number for the anticlimactic. <laughs> at least it worked this time and didn't seem to, didn't explode or anything. Yeah, okay, that's the end of the video this time, I think. Thanks for watching. Wait, 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 hold on. One more test. I thought since I had all this stuff out here ready to go, I'd just put one of the bought props on. This is a Aerostar, I think it says on the front of it. And this is also a 16 by 8, but it's a, the profile of the prop is less chunky at the root than my one. Oh, it's less chunky at the tip as well. It's, it seems to be slimmer all round. So anyway, let's give this a spin up and we'll see what we get for current at 1 amp and then full throttle. See that at 1 kilo thrust, it was only 9 amps versus 11 for mine. And let's see if we can beat 2.5 kilos at full throttle. So the full throttle thrust is about the same by the looks of it. But we're not really so concerned with that. We're, we're more concerned if, we're doing, if we want to do long distance flights. We want to do, I mean, we want to be looking at the efficiency at a, like a cruise throttle. So, so far my prop's not holding up to these ones very well. Um, Oh, well, it's not far off, you know. 9 versus 11. Not bad considering it's just a first attempt and it wasn't even supposed to be spinning. Um, it's just, just one that I made to get used to feed speeds and, and using the ball nose, you know, 3D, 3D contour milling and stuff. So considering that, I think it's done alright. Anyway, this is finally the end of the video. Bye.